Greetings, this is Mike Grain. Welcome to another edition of the Walton Supply Chain Center, focusing on on-shelf availability. Today, I get the chance to kind of share my ideas and my thoughts on the state of the industry as it relates to on-shelf availability. I've got a couple of clips from this year's uh, particular podcast, but really it's focusing on what are the different people, processes, and technology to be able to look at on-shelf availability and make improvements. Let's get started. So you heard Bill Hargrave talk about that. Dr. Hargrave says, you really need to know what you have and where it's located. And I've used this big idea theme for a lot, and it's pretty intuitive to understand, but what would the world look like if you could literally lift the cover off a store, look down, and know exactly what you had and exactly where it was located at a relatively real-time basis? And that's where, that's the challenge that retailers have. How do I develop systems to be able to do that? And there's two ways to think about it. Most retailers think about this as in stock versus on shelf. In stock means I have it on hand and that number is bigger than when I think I'll sell. The problem with that is both of those numbers tend to be inaccurate. What I have on hand, we already talked about being 50 or 60%. Daily demand is what I think I'll sell and that's a sales forecast and that's probably not a lot better. Maybe it's 75, 80%, but they're two numbers that are together not very accurate, but you're using those to calculate what the in-stock is. What you wanna be measuring is what's actually available for customer purchase. And that's what we're gonna spend some time talking about. What is it exactly that the customer see? I would argue that a lot of retailers don't think about on-shelf availability or just availability and measuring that like other KPIs, okay? So things like, what was my on-shelf availability number today. Well, today, if you look at this chart, it's probably in the 95% range. Well, is that good or bad? Well, it depends on what your goal is. If your goal is 95, you're doing pretty well. How's am I doing versus last year? So it allows you to measure these particular important factors to customers around whether the product is available to do that. Now, I think everybody would say, yeah, that's great. I'd love to be able to do that. I don't know how to do that. What we're going to do is going to walk you through some some new thinking about how some approaches that would potentially do that. So let's talk through these. One of them is an algorithm. Um, an algorithm. I'm going to give you at the at the at the end of this. I'm going to kind of give you a couple of companies. I'm not endorsing the companies, but I think they're very good companies that could potentially be help, used to help you if you're either in the CPG world or if you're a retailer. This one is an algorithm. This this works really well on high velocity items. You see here, I'm kind of chugging along at 15 and 16 and 12, and I'm selling a bunch, and all of a sudden, that number goes to zero. Well, I'm not sure what the on-hand of that item is. It's pretty sure that product's no longer available to a customer. I can say that with a fair degree of certainty. And uh, what I do then is drive an alert either to the store associate to look at that item or to potentially a third-party broker or merchandiser like Acosta or Anderson or folks like that, to go address that issue, fix it, find out that there's a problem, get it back on the shelf, and then we call what this, the rest of this is, we call recovered sales. If you've been able to find an issue, fix the issue, get it back on the shelf, then you watch to see, and obviously the orange item got put put back on the shelf because it went back to the normal rhythm of selling the product. The blue one or black one, I can't tell what color it is, is probably still not on the shelf for a customer regardless. This particular technology, just to frame out where it works well, it works really well with high velocity items. Paper towels, laundry detergent, kind of, kind of fast moving consumer goods work really, really well. It's accurate, it's timely. There's some really good things you can literally, if you get the data fast enough, you can run through this and literally within the same day, half day, get the data, process it, generate the alerts, fix the alerts and get things back on the shelf. So certainly not real time, but very, very, very fast. And I, and I think it's an important tool for people to look at to be able to solve this. What are some of the down things, the downsides? Well, number one, it struggles with things that don't move very high. So if I've got an item that says I'm selling one or two a month, well, am I out of stock or not on the shelf? Or is it just not moving enough to generate that kind of sale. So lower velocity skews, it can be trained. It's getting better and better. These algorithms are getting better and better all the time, but they still struggle with the lack of data and being able to learn it to make sure you're delivering alerts that people can go work that that aren't false, false alerts. The other thing is this is really problematic in things like apparel because apparel is, 
you know, I, I may sell one shoe, one sock, you know, a bra, et cetera, and I may not sell any for the next three weeks. It also requires another downside is it requires a lot of data, probably a year to two years of buy store, buy day, buy item kind of data to pr- develop the, the algorithm to be able to say when things we expected to be sale and if there's a drift from that alerted. Um, and the only other thing that it doesn't do as very well is it doesn't measure the on-hand accuracy. It can tell you if it's on the shelf fairly accurately, but it struggles with, with the ability to be able to, to see if it's on shelf or not. The second uh, uh, option is store audits. Um, and we got some great companies that we'll talk about here in a little bit. Uh, one of them is the field agent folks who've, who've been doing this for a long time. Uh, this is actually sending crowdsourced people into stores, taking pictures based upon, you know, a customer not being just a customer, but they're actually providing value back to the retailer and the CPG community. It's a pretty cost-effective model. It, it's very fast. Uh, I've seen incredible increases in the accuracy of uh, images and the, the data that comes out of that. Um, and so, and, and I think some of the companies have come up with, you know, models that 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 are some more self-service models, which I think are a great addition to this capability. Um, they are tend to be kind of project by project. So it's not a systemic thing like an algorithm or some other options we're going to talk about. They're typically project by project. They're, they're not census. They're typically sample. So to be able to measure on-shelf availability of a retail chain uh, across the time period, you have to use more of a sampling technique. So it's not that's not census data. That that's maybe not be a bad thing, but that is the true. And the other thing is, unless you actually have these uh, in store in store uh, resources doing counting of things, you, again, you can't see the on hand accuracy. You can just see if the product is there or not. Okay. Um, Here's one that continues to grow, and we did a podcast on uh, the major players uh, in the industry uh, probably about six months ago. It'll be on the On Shelf Availability website. These are shelf scanning robots. There are several of them that I'll mention here in a little bit. You know, they basically create a realogram for every store, for every for every category, for every day. They can usually run two or three times a day. By the time they rent, scan a whole store, go back and recharge, and then and then go scan again. Um, they are very accurate. They're timely. They could also do multiple functions. Some functions actually do a run on the ro- on the floor uh, and clean the floors. Some of them inspect the floors, like the Badger one that's here actually inspects the floor. Uh, and then it goes back to redox and then it does a shelf, shelf scan. So it could be do other things in the store. Some of them have been equipped with RFID readers and temperature sensors, so it can actually measure other things other than just the 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 computer vision portion that it does here all right what's some of the downsides the downsides is a couple uh it's certainly more expensive than a lot of the other uh resources it's a capital investment or or, or a or some kind of a, a investment that the retailer has to make uh, secondly one of the challenges of these is and we'll we'll get this with fixed cameras here in a second you can only see really the first the first facing. You can't see what's behind the cans that were just there. You can see the first one. You don't know if the other ones are the same product or different products, et cetera. Um, it certainly struggles with trying to scan things like apparel that, that all look the same or cosmetics that are extremely small and they look like they're actually the same kind of packaging and the, uh, the, uh, the computer vision and artificial intelligence kind of struggles with that. And then again, last thing is, you know, on-hand accuracy. It's not going to be able to measure that. A um, couple more RFID. We're going to go more into this in a minute, but uh, certainly RFID has its place in retail. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but it's, it is a way of being able to use an RFID tag and actually without line of sight, being able to count exactly what you have. And for the most part, kind of where it's located in the store. It's really good for on-hand accuracy backroom picking, BOPUS, asset protection kind of purposes. It does on-hand accuracy very, very well. It doesn't do as well to tell you exactly where the product is because it reads so well. It can read 10 to 15 to 20 feet. You don't know if it's right where in front of you or if it's on the shelf on the opposite side of where he's wanting right now. It could be reading tags there. So it doesn't do as good a job as, as the store audit, the shelf scanning robots when it comes to the location of the project, uh, at least when you do the handheld uh, portion of this. Okay. Um, man, I'm not really monitoring questions, so if you can interrupt me at any point in time, if sure. you've got a question that needs to come through, I would appreciate it. Um, here's an interesting one. This is one that's starting to grow a little bit. Some retailers, for their BOPIS activities, are having their own 
associates. Walmart, for example, has their own associates doing online picking and putting product in customers, uh, st- you know, back of their cars, delivery to their home is that a great service, tremendous, you know, I, I think I, I think they started down that path prior to COVID, but COVID kind of, as, as Dr. Hargrave mentioned, really made that a, a must have. And, and I think it's still in play today. But one of the things, this one happens to be a, a company that that actually does this as a service um, and they literally shop for a customer. Now, when, when she's buying the things off the customer list, it certainly gives them the ability to be able to say, here's all the stuff. They also know what items were on that list that when they went to buy them, they could not find. That's called a nil pick. And that's what it says on the left-hand side here. Um, so some of the some of the benefits to this solution, obviously it is very customer facing. I mean, this is a real customer shopping for a real customer. Um, that is the best is, is, way of measuring whether it was on the shelf or not, assuming they did a good job of trying to find the item. It is as real time out of stock as it can get because you're getting that data kind of real time. Um, the downside is it doesn't do every product every day unless you order. You know, if a grocery store has sixty thousand items, I would imagine that all not all sixty thousand items are being picked every single day. So you don't get data every day unless it's picked. Uh, and then connecting to this data and then driving it back through your store operations is sometimes challenging because of its uh, real time nature. And by the way, by the time a customer comes in to buy something or a a shopper comes in to buy something for on behalf of another customer and it's out of stock, it's already too late. You've already disappointed somebody. Somebody has to either make a substitution or something like that. So those are some of the downsides of that. Um, last one but not least is fixed cameras. And, and this is certainly one that is an option as well. Um, they are real time. They're looking at the shelf across the aisle. 24 hours, seven days a week, or as long as the retailer is open, they're able to tell you immediately, uh, unlike the shelf scanning robot that only may walk by that shelf two or three times a day, this is measuring on shelf availability real time of what's across the aisle. Uh, it can it can actually detect both out of stock and low stock as well. It is more expensive than these other options, and it's certainly a challenge because every time you redo a modular or do store layout kind of changes, it becomes a challenge because you've got to move cameras and things like that as well. Uh, but I think it, these are kind of things that, that are going to be future considerations that be taken into account that, that they'll get around figuring out how to make that happen. Last but not least, the, the fixed cameras can't count either. They can see what's on the first, the first facing, but they can't see what's behind that. So that's a lot of detail about how the real question that people are going to say is, well, which one should I choose? And I'd love to be able to just say, well, here's the one you should choose. Unfortunately, it depends. And we're going to talk a little bit about that later. For a retail apparel uh, player like a Macy's or, or Dick's Sporting Goods or Nordstrom's, they've already made the decision that RFID is going to be their way forward. Other particular retailers, where that, like Walmart or Kroger, et cetera, where you may have some general merchandise and some grocery and some consumables and some fresh, you're going to have to have multiple sensors. You're going to have to have computer vision. You're going to have to have RFID. Uh, you may have to have 2D barcode methodology to be able to read and some things like that. Uh, so so not to get into the watch for every every one of them, but for sure, uh, it is it is absolutely important to know you're going to have to you're going to have to figure out how to operate in an environment where you have multiple sensors that are that are delivering the data to you. Okay. Um, so I'm going to briefly go over these. These are very quick, high level, but I want to give you a list of folks that I have been known, I've worked with over the last year or so. And again, this is not an endorsement. I'm not telling you to do this. They've not provided any funding that we're endorsing this video. That is absolutely not the case. But what we have done is worked with them enough to know they have something that it may be worthwhile for you to consider. You have to use that. You use your own, use your own consideration. So I'm doing everything I can to be w- walking very carefully here because I, I really like these folks, but I'm not trying to endorse them or anything like that. All right, enough of that. So first and foremost, uh, the couple of companies that do algorithms, Retail Insight, they've been doing it for years, years and years and years. Team Core uh, ha- has a, a service offering, I believe now that's mostly outside the United States, but they have another set of uh, options as well. And then I think you know, obviously, there's sales and marketing companies out there, such as Acosta, Anderson, uh, Premium is part of a uh, of Acosta now. 
Uh, we've got people like Crossmark. Uh, we've got folks uh, in like Advantage Sales and Marketing. All good companies all do a really good job of competing in the space to be the arms and legs in the store to to react to these issues that you see in store and get product back on the shelf. Ooh, excuse me. A um, couple of folks that, that I want to make sure that you're aware of, and we've done podcasts with these companies as well. Again, the yeah, on-shelf availability, go back and take a look at that one Matt is putting together uh, as, as part of conversations on retail. But both of these companies, both field agent and tracks, do a really good job of collecting in-store conditions. Uh, they have a different model. One's crowdsourcing, one's not. Uh, but the bottom line is they do both a very, very fantastic job. And, and I would encourage you to listen to the podcast that we had on them to talk about the services that they offer. Um, we had a very interesting uh, podcast about six months ago with all of the leading uh, shelf scanning robot manufacturers, Brain Corporation, Badger, Simbi, Zippity, um, a lot of really interesting. It was, it was interesting because I had all the CEOs on the on the podcast of these various companies. And what they were doing is talking about industry challenges, not so much what their solution did versus the other ones, but instead how this particular solution fit, where it fit, where it didn't fit, where it made sense, et cetera. Uh, definitely worth exploring and, and uh, taking a look at that. Um, RFID, we've had we've had several folks. We've had uh, Eric and the folks on from Zebra, Paul Boboyan, et cetera. Uh, uh, Terry Durham on from Zebra talking about the Zebra solution. Uh, Dean Fru from SML, who's, who, who provides both tags as well as uh, software solutions. Bill Tony uh, from Avery Dennison, who is probably the leading RFID tag uh, supplier in the world. Uh, and they offer, offer software solutions as well, uh, et cetera. So there's a, there's a few names there. And then we've got a couple with focal systems at SES and Magatag, if you're interested in exploring. We've had both of them on a podcast as well talking about, again, the value of how fixed cameras work versus potentially other solutions that are out there. Okay. Last but not least, uh, we did have a podcast with the, these folks as well. They may not have a solution by itself, a standalone solution, but one of the things that the robots and frankly, the, um, the field agent and tracks resources, uh, as well as the fixed cameras all have in common is they need to be able to use both computer vision and artificial intelligence to be able to take that realogram or that picture, that electronic picture, no matter how it was captured, and turn it into insights that say, I can see that product is different than what I was expecting, or I can see a label without a product, all that AI and computer vision. And um, we, we, this particular technology gets better and better and better every single year. When it first came out, we really struggled with the reliability of et cetera, but it continues to get better. Uh, and I keep close eye on it because I think the computer vision or CV and artificial intelligence, these four companies are doing a great job with it. Uh, and I think there's others that are starting up to try and jump in that space as well. And I think it's a, a pretty important space to be in. Um, we'll t let's double dip, a double dip a little bit into the the whole thing, RFID. And I think that's an important thing that we want to kind of talk through as we kind of wrap up. Because RFID is basically exploding in the industry right now from a retail perspective. We're seeing it in retailers that want to know what they have and where it's located. Uh, from a retail on-hand accuracy, picking, asset protection, I'll walk you through some of those in a little bit. We're seeing a tremendous increase in the uh, interest of RFID for food. Again, we have a podcast out about there about RFID for food. We talk with both Justin Patton and... Uh, some of the folks who are kind of working in the uh, Adam Anderson from Avery Dennison talking about leveraging RFID for date age product. And how do you make sure you have fresh product? How do you make sure you're, you're, you're replenishing the, the, the inventory? So from the time it gets picked to the, from the field until it actually gets into the store, you're doing the first in, first out. If things are that, that are starting to get marked down for a quick sale, you know what those items are, et cetera. RFID can play a role with that. Uh, and obviously, it's outside of retail, but RFID is really taking off uh, in the aerospace industry with every time you fly on Delta, your RFID, your bag is RFID tagged, so it gets on the right airline. Uh, they do an RFID scan of, of the entire uh, plane between between trips to make sure all the oxygen masks and seat belts and all that kind of stuff there, that's all using RFID technology. 
But for retail, how many do I have? I'm in obviously a, a, a sporting goods type store here. I have no idea how many shirts I've got, how many socks I've got, et cetera. RFID is playing an important role. Uh, you've seen it work before. You saw it in the video, but basically there's a tag. There's a reader. Uh, that tag is energized and woken up and it sends it to some software that says, I've just counted 12 pairs of jeans. And by the way, the on hand you had was 14. So we're going to change the on hand down to 12 to reflect what you've got here. Uh, Mike Price asked a question a while back, which is, well, well, what is the relationship of shrink to on hand accuracy? And this is kind of where I thought I would double click on that a little bit, Mike. I think that the relationship is if on hand accuracy was always 100%, which says you always got what you paid for from the from the source who's sending it to you, if whether it's a DC or whether a supplier or whatever, and in that everybody always paid for things that are leaving the store and there were no administrative markup, markdown kinds of things like pricing, et cetera, you wouldn't have to have RFID. You're, you would always be very, very, very accurate. The problem is you have to use RFID because you don't always get what you pay for from a receiving standpoint. Um, ORC or organized retail crime is on the outbreak. We've seen Walmart and Target and Home Depot all declare to the industry, this is a industry problem. We've got to figure out how to get uh, this figured out. We have people like Lowe's um, Home Improvement that are literally putting RFID tags in power drills. So if you don't run your power drill through the register and you just pick it up at the shelf and walk out, that product will not work. It's called Project Unlock if you're interested in that. Uh, it's pretty fascinating technology. There's a lot of implications to doing something like that. But obviously shrink, theft, um, both organized retail crime, crimes of opportunity, frankly, store associates, all that is, is kind of playing into a really difficult situation. And I think RFID, while it may not be the solving problem, it lets you know what left the store that did not get paid for. And I think that's one of the, the definite use cases for it. Um, Retailer adoption of RFID continues on the rise. Uh, you've probably heard recently that both Dick's Sporting Goods and Nordstrom's are now joining it. And I've actually got a slide here that we saw at RFID Journal, just looking at the implementations, the amount of RFID expansion going on, you, you can see a pretty big jump uh, from 2018 to 2023 in terms of the amount of tags. This is from obviously from the Auburn RFID lab. So it's continuing to grow. Some of these are not just retail. Obviously, people like UPS are actively engaging with UPS with RFID for package tracking, but uh, certainly the market is going to continue to grow uh, in terms of needs for that. Um, one of the things that I, that I wanted to kind of cover real quickly, whether it's an on-shelf availability, if it's a potential putting a robot in or a fixed camera, whatever, you know, my learnings at RFID, uh, have I think, are... are play out in terms of a number of different projects like this. Number one, it has to be business driven. And there's a lot of folks out there that are saying, yeah, I've got a cool tool. Come check out the cool tool. It's critically important that you understand what is the business problem I have first and then apply the right tools to it. I took you through the four or five or six options for collecting on shelf availability for a reason, because it's not a, it's not a paint roller. You, you've got to be really clear about what you're trying to get done real clear on the categories you're trying to get it done for uh, and for, for, that, for, for that particular matter. You got to be able to know what the business problem is. Uh, Henry's saying, what would you tell the retailer to do to partner with their vendors to change the game and measure measurable impact with OSA? Well, Henry, I think that's a great question. I think the, I think the suppliers do have a role there. Uh, but part of, it's, part of it is, I believe strongly in sharing this on-shelf availability both with the retailer and with the the actual CPG company. This information about what is available and where is it located, how many units are in a case, what are the opportunities, whether it's missing labels, et cetera, how do we leverage the resources within the CPG community to help assist the retailer, case packaging, there's a ton of things that, that could potentially be used. But the first is, to me, is just to recognize to a retailer that it's important to them to a CPG, it's important to them. And the, to, to ask that basic question, how can we collaborate together to make sure we're driving on-shelf availability across the box? And, and clearly that's that's happening today in terms of you know things being stolen. And well, let's just lock them up behind cabinets. That'll keep it from stealing. 
Yeah, but you definitely create a really negative consumers uh, customers when you do that. So yeah, that would be my thing. It's, it's got to be business driven. Secondly, it's got to be top leadership. Um, most of these projects that I've seen be successful have been successful because you have a strategic leader at the top of the company that is pushing and says, we've got to fundamentally change and we're going to have change. This is not a technology product. This is a this is a change management project, which is going to require people, processes, and technology. And frankly, the technology is the last piece that people should be thinking of. One of the best success stories, just for you guys to know, uh, we had a podcast a while back, probably about four months ago. Again, it'll be on the Unshelf Availability site. But we talked a little bit to some several experts on Unshelf Availability, specifically buy online, pick up at store. Walmart has no has probably gone through five iterations of executing RFID at retail, and it never stuck. And by the way, I've been involved with each one of them. They've all failed for a different reason. Sometimes it wasn't right. Sometimes they were trying to do the wrong thing with the technology. Sometimes it was you know legal uh, issues outside of the industry that were causing problems. But the bottom line is it finally got into a point where we had a, a leader who wanted to be able to deliver uh, the product in the store and deliver it, uh, make it available to customers for online picking. That was Deanna Baker, who's the former SVP at Walmart. She was she was adamant that she wanted to have her associates picking products, both grocery products and apparel products, to take care of customer needs. So let's hear a little bit from her. Again, this podcast is available, but but I think it'd be really interesting to hear kind of her strategic f focus of why she tried decided to implement RFID at Walmart. I wanted to be able to leverage the store pickup process within what I saw as developing in the stores uh, through grocery pickup for apparel. I'd be able to really leverage that inventory. I also knew that resource investment would only occur if there was trust in our inventory accuracy. Um, no one was going to spend precious labor to chase down phantom inventory to then just ultimately disappoint customers. And then when you said that the entire apparel industry, not just Walmart, had an accuracy rate of about 50 percent, um, that was shocking to me. You know, it wasn't just my problem. It was an industry problem. One of the first steps was in understanding how RFID actually worked and not what I remembered from a, some attempts in the past. And overcoming that, um, I, I think, was a, a, a huge step change for our organization. We communicated with all of our supplier partners, right, and really rallied them. And it took a full year to flush through the inventory to be all RFID tagged. The truth is that none of this really would have come to fruition had we not had advocates and champions within the various disciplines of the box to really help us bring RFID um, to a, to to Walmart and and our dream of reality. All right, so let me let me close with a couple of uh, uh, kind of final thoughts here. Uh, the first is RFID has been talked about as primarily on hand accuracy, and it clearly has a huge play of getting that on hand accuracy. Uh, it also has, and I'll go back to to Mike Price's question around you know loss prevention or asset protection. Imagine having the ability to be able to not only have product in your store, but if it leaves the store through a register and leaves the store you would know it. And if it gets picked up and walks out the store, you would know it as well. So you would actually know whether that item went through a register or whether it just left the store. Uh, Macy's has done probably the best job of, of any retailer I've seen to date, leveraging RFID and actually prosecuting ORC crime rings of product that they know that they bought in the, for the store. It was inside of the Macy's store. It left the Macy's store without being paid for at a register and literally being able to go out and capture that unique serialized data or se serialized item and be able to report back to federal uh, authorities that that product was stolen and shutting down those crime rates. I think it's an, an enormous opportunity of leveraging RFID for asset protection purposes. Uh, the elimination of food waste, I already mentioned that one. I think food, food traceability, recalls, all that kind of stuff, incredibly important because it is important to know every not only that I have a UPC and a quantity, which is the traditional way we do retail. You know, I've got a UPC on this particular bottle and I've got 10 of them. Well, with RFID, I literally get a unique serial number of each one of the 10. It's kind of like having a VIN number in your car. I have a VIN number for every one of these water bottles. 
And so I can tell you the state and status of every one of those. And we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that and hit that here in a second. But I think that's going to be the future of retailers getting down to a itemized, item serialized level for being able to track things uh, in the retail supply chain. Okay. Um, there's a bunch of, and I, I've X'd out all this because retailers have asked me, well, what's it worth? Well, you have to make some assumptions about what these are worth. But to build in the, the infrastructure needed to do this, you have to move away from a handheld wand, which is what most retailers do today, and start to look at other infrastructure like fixed infrastructure, robots, cameras, things like that, that are going to collect the data you need. And I'm not going to go through this whole graph, but you obviously see you can do a limited set of things with wanding. They're incredibly important and very valuable. But as you start to look at things like location accuracy and shrink up reporting and asset tracking, et cetera, you have to invest in more than just a handheld infrastructure. And that's part of the, the cost of doing business uh, at retail today. So I'm going to go back and summarize, you know, kind of what I said at the beginning of this thing, which is uh, you got to know what you have and you got to know where it's located to be a disruptor. Uh, two more things that we're going to focus on for for, for kind of the, the time going forward. Number one, just continue to tell a story that there are there are tools out there that you can use. You got to know what your industry problem is. You got to know what the right tool is. I'm a big woodworker. I've got a great big shop. I would never try and cut a board with a hammer. I could probably cut a board with a hammer, but it would take a lot of time. It wouldn't be very pretty and it would be messy, right? A saw is a better tool. And that's kind of the way I think about the retail supply chain. There, you got to figure out what exactly you're trying to get done to make sure you choose the right tool for it. Uh, that's the way I think about that. But but a summary that, that I want to make here, number one is we're going to have to figure out how to live in a multi-sensor solution. It's not computer vision or AI or RFID and 2D barcode or Digimark and whatever. It's a lot of them working together and collectively every single item has a way of uniquely knowing where it is and where it's located. The industry struggles with this today. Uh, there's no solution you can buy out of the box to be able to do this. You got to figure out what you need for your business and then apply it to it. The second one that's very important, we already mentioned this on RFID, but there's a new initiative, not new, it's relatively it, they've been working on it for a while. They've just sort of launched it this year, which is called Sunset 2027. It's part of the GS1 initiative. What it means is every single point of sale register will need to be able to scan a 2D barcode or a QR code in addition to just a single UPC. What does that mean? That means back to this bottle, I know this bottle and I know where it's located. And this is different than the bottle I've got right next to it that looks the same. Okay, well, what would I do that, Mike? As you start thinking about things like televisions in a store, I may have three televisions in the store, but one of the televisions is on the on the back wall showing customers how they work. One of the televisions just came in as a return from a customer, and it's back in claims. So I may have three particular televisions, but I really only have one available for sale because one's on the wall and one's back in claims. With this serialized methodology, you can actually start to assign state and status to specific items. And that doesn't, that's not just RFID. That's the same as with, with a, bo a box of Tide or a bottle of Tide or a paper towel, et cetera. We can start to look at attributes with items beyond just what the UPC is. And I think this is a huge migration opportunity uh, that we got to work forward. Um, including that is the whole sharing data uh, with the various supply chain folks. You know, we, we've got different ways of doing it. Uh, GS1 has EPCIS. Specific retailers like Walmart have Retail Link and, and uh, things like that. Uh, we've got ways of sharing data. There's not a consistent way to do it across the industry. And I think that's one of the challenges as well. So lots of fairly good things uh, that, that can continue on this platform. We're going to continue to have conversations with subject matter experts of this to go a lot more deeper. Uh, but I did want to mention, uh, Matt, just in, in closing on my part anyway, to see if we have any other additional questions out there uh, or if there's any cl closing comments that you want to make. Mike, just uh, looks like look, another question from Mike Price. Based on your current knowledge, do you believe OSA is going to improve or decline in the next 12 months? Uh, that's a great question. My hope is, Mike, that it gets better. Um, my hope is that people will continue to realize that this is a incredibly important KPI that they have to look at 
and that they're going to put the right resources against doing it. I'm not advocating being 100% OSA. I don't think that's financially smart to figure out how to be 100%. You wouldn't want to pay for that. But clearly, customers have more choices than ever. So I think by default, people are going to get better at doing this, whether that's reducing the number of SKUs they have and going back to the old hold more holding capacity on the shelf or some of the technologies we talked about here. I'm certainly hopeful, and that's the reason that I'm spending time in this area, that it's going to get better. But it's not a it's not it's a change management project. It's something you're going to have to decide at a senior level to focus on. You got to measure it. You got to figure out how you're going to improve it where you're not meeting goals and treat it like any other KPI running a retail or a CPG company. So from my perspective, it will. But I guess at the end of the day, it's it's a report card on how well we're kind of educating the, the industry. I think people kind of walk away from this stuff because it's really hard, <laughs> but but it's d- something that's obviously very, very important. And obviously, we've seen before years and years of examples where retailers choose to not innovate and continue to focus on meeting customer needs. And by the way, they're not around anymore. They've gone, they've gone by the wayside. So- I think the ones that are really focusing on this and doing the right thing, both omni-channel and brick and mortar and figuring out how to make that product available, uh, they're focusing on the right level. Um, The other ones may not be around long term. Great stuff, Mike. Uh, Appreciate everything that you have done to develop this uh, this series and this group. Uh, Appreciate the folks that have registered to attend. Appreciate our sponsors. We will have the video version of this uh, edited over the weekend and up on the onshelfavailability.com website for everyone to Uh, to review again, share with their teams. And we'll look forward to seeing everyone back here again for our next conversation on retail. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, that wraps up our discussion on the state of the industry for on-shelf availability. Join us next time. We're going to be joining with uh, Justin Patton and Matthew Russell from the Auburn University RFID Lab talking about the status of RFID in the retail industry, in food, and potentially we'll get a little bit into aviation. Not exactly focusing on on on-shelf availability, but just different ways that that technology is helping serve those industries. 